we should uh, make a start. Um, so let me start by welcoming everyone to this uh, challenge, this uh, this sort of uh, session that we have organised, which focuses on the early challenges um, for women in academia, with a sort of focus on experiences uh, across Europe. So this has been organised by the Women in Economics uh, Standing Committee, and um, in particular by um, Jose um, de Sousa, who is here, um, Jacob. Um, uh, so God, who couldn't be here, and, and myself. Um, I also want to thank our three uh, speakers, so Cecilia, and Carlo, and um, Natalia, um, and also to Gemma and, and Georgia, who are not here right now, but uh, for organizing the whole thing. Um, so the format is going to be that we'll give each speaker about 15 minutes, and then followed by another 15 minutes for open discussion and some questions. So the, the aim of this session has really been to sort of think about the um, paths and the, the sort of um, the differences in the paths to promotion, um, where there might be differences by gender, but also thinking a little bit about differences across Europe. We, we often see that there is a, a, a great deal of focus on the US, both in terms of discussion, but also in terms of, um, of looking at the data. And this is partly because there is uh, a lot more available data. Um, the system tends to be much more homogenous. And so what we're hoping to do kind of today is to start opening up a discussion which kind of tries to put this a little bit more into the context of uh, Europe where, where there is a great deal more diversity. So we're going to start with the, the, the different uh, talks and hopefully we'll kind of keep talking. Um, and there is a, a sort of drinks as well um, event, which um, hopefully you will join us uh, for afterwards too. So I think, uh, Carlo, you want to uh, start? Then, uh, thank you very much all for coming. And I hope everybody can hear me. It's uh, great to see you all here despite the late hour. And given that it's me standing between you and the twinks, I will hopefully, hopefully stay on time. So you can already see the title of my presentation today, which is also uh, a title of a joint paper I've written with Alessandro Iaria, who's actually here today, and Fabian Waldinger. And we started this project really with the idea that we wanted to provide like an extremely broad overview of gender gaps and how they have evolved over the 20th century. And uh, especially as Gazala highlighted, that most of the evidence basically really often, all too often focuses on the United States. And here as a motivation, uh, is a picture from the Solvay 1927 conference. It's like one of the most famous conferences that have taken place in the sciences, where 18 of the 29 people you see in this photo were actually uh, had, either had won the Nobel Prize or were, went on to win the Nobel Prize. So in the middle of this slide, you also see Albert Einstein. But the most famous scientist in this photo is actually the women, and also the only women at this conference, uh, Marie Curie, and uh, basically the uh, two times Nobel Prize winner. And fortunately, by today, we do slightly better at uh, conference participation of uh, female academics. As a matter of fact, there are probably more female academics in this room than there were in the whole of Germany in 1900 or 1914. Um, so what our paper aims really to do is to basically uh, provide descriptive evidence of which changes occurred, which basically and how gender gaps have evolved across all the countries in the world and across nearly all fields in academia. So to get at this, we, uh, we embarked uh, on like a large data collection effort. In fact, basically we digitized the books you saw or you see in this picture, and it now uh, by now took us over 10 years to really prepare this data. But what this data gives us is close to 500,000 academics all over the world. So we have nearly 7,000 uh, universities or institutes of higher education in over 130 countries. And basically, the coverage of these books goes in different cohorts from 1900 until 1969. And through an further data collection effort, we also have extended this data until the 2000s. And even though I only have 15 minutes, I want to don't uh, basically, uh, I also want to use the time to thank all our research assistants and our research managers without whom this data collection wouldn't have been possible. 
Um, but what we then do with this data is we analyze gender gaps in academia along four dimensions. We start by analyzing gender gaps in hiring, and we document how they see the female share increases from around 1% in 1900 to around basically 17% in 2000. Of course, we are still nowhere, even today, we are nowhere near to uh, parity. Uh, then we analyze gender gaps in publications and document like a U-shaped pattern about which I will have to say more later in my presentations, followed by gender gaps in citation and gender gaps in promotions. And hopefully uh, I will have time to cover this. There are of course a lot more things we do in the paper, but given in the interest of time, I will just uh, focus on these uh, four gender gaps. So. Um, given, uh, I also usually I spend a lot of time if I give a longer seminar talking about the data and the data enhancements, but what I want to rather uh, spend the time on today is to talk about some of the examples we have in our data. And the first one is basically the woman I already mentioned, Marie Curie, uh, who was the two times Nobel Prize winner. But only from her career, we can learn a lot about basically what the situations were for women uh, basically in the early 1900s. So despite having won a Nobel Prize, she was not given a professorship at the University of Paris. Only after her husband uh, basically tragically uh, died in a, basically an accident, and basically only a few years before she won her second Nobel Prize, was she then finally begrudgingly uh, granted a position at the University of Paris. But as you might be able to see, if you are standing close enough uh, or are close enough to the front, even so her husband is actually dead in 1914, she's still listed as Madame Pierre Curie. And she also published papers under this name. Uh, so even so, basically, uh, despite her achievements, she was still very much linked uh, to her dead husband. In our 1938 cohort, we then observe uh, Marie Curie's daughter, who was actually the second woman to win a Nobel Prize in the sciences, uh, also in chemistry, like her mother, um, who then also worked in the University of Paris. Further, in the 1969 cohort, we observe Marie Gerhard Meyer, who is the second woman uh, to win the Nobel Prize, more or less 60 years after Marie Curie. But even so, uh, basically, she was an extremely successful physicist only three years before she won the Nobel Prize, and more than 10 years after doing her most important work, was she actually granted a position at the University of San Diego in the United States. And last but not least, in the 2000 cohort, which is not any longer from these books, but were collected by us uh, from the university websites, uh, basically we observe Frances H. Arnold, who is the 2018 Nobel Prize winner um, in chemistry. In the paper, we have a lot more examples and uh, discussions about these topics, but just, just to give you an overview of basically the press of our data and also some of the different countries that are covered. Um, what's going to matter a bit for the following uh, analysis and also following discussions is that we uh, perform our analysis for three different samples. The first one focuses on all universities in the world in our data from 1900 until 1969 and will cover all scientific disciplines, so including economics, the social sciences, the humanities. Then we have a sample two, which includes all universities, but focus particularly on the scientific disciplines, mathematics, chemistry, and biochemistry, for which we have good publication data. Um, we are currently working on extending the set of subjects further, uh, but for now, these are the three subjects we are focusing on. And last but not least, we have a third sample that focuses on prestigious universities across different countries, which we have selected. And for this sample, we, are, uh, we have collected the data for the 2000 uh, cohort. So anything in the 2000 cohort will be uh, based on this sample of 240 uh, prestigious universities. So. Uh, then, uh, as indicated, let, we can get started with gender gaps in hiring. So, um, and this is one of the main graphs, again, as indicated for the first sample in our data. And as you see, we start from a female share around 1%, and uh, then we see like this share is slowly increasing over time until 1969, where we reach around like maybe like around 12% for all academics and around 8% among the full professors. Um, 
as stated, we can extend this analysis for prestigious universities. And the first pattern that arises here is that for the female share in prestigious universities across all countries is always consistently lower than um, basically for the non-prestigious universities. And we can also see that um, more progress has been made in the female participation in academia from 1969 until today than in all previous years combined. And the female share uh, by far more than doubled since this period. But again, we observe also that the gap is far larger uh, or, the, or the difference between all scientists and full professor positions is still remains very large and we are nowhere near to parity even in uh, this set of data. Uh, we also have some analysis done basically for heterogeneities across countries where this, uh, I think in the interest of time, I just want to highlight two data points or two country time series where we see that the United States actually starts out very high in the beginning of the 20th century, which is due to the presence of women colleges, which allowed women to attend institutions of higher education compared to or in difference to many countries in Europe, uh, while most countries virtually start at a zero female share. And um, most uh, really, in, uh, until 1969, the absolute majority of female academics worked in the United States. So given that also the US university sector overall is very large. But we see that since 1969, like a lot of change has happened. And by now, by today's standards, the United States is rather at the lower end of the countries we are plotting here. Another interesting example is the case of Japan, which is just lumped together with all these other universities here at the bottom. But then you see that hardly any progress has been made in Japan, where like the uh, share of female academics remains uh, far below 5%. So after these gender gaps in hiring, what can we say about publications? And here we just estimate regressions on the number of publications and then interactions of our uh, female indicators with indicators for the respective cohorts of our data. So what these indicators will tell us is what's the difference in the number of publications between men and women in our data. And we can control for like additional fixed effects, cohort, country, university, subject. Uh, most of this time, basically, uh, these uh, make not such a big difference for our finding. But what we find over time when we look at this is this maybe, at least to us, it was at the first uh, look a surprising pattern. It is that the gender gap in publications in 1900 is actually close to zero and not statistically significant. And then it's consistently widening over the 20th century until 1969. And then only in the 2000 cohort, it seems to narrow. And this is this U-shaped pattern I refer to in the introduction, which we uh, call the gender U in our paper. And to us, it was surprising, at least compared to, if we compare it to other findings in the literature and research done by Cart and de la Vigna, uh, which consistently find narrowing gaps when they look at these outcomes like membership in prestigious uh, societies. Um, so we felt that basically this demanded like, at least uh, some type of explanation. So what we proposed uh, is the following uh, idea that could underlie this U-shaped pattern. So on the one hand, we see that the gender gaps in uh, hiring and narrowing. So the bias against women in hiring seems to narrow, but um, to basically this might, on the other hand, of course, have an impact on the basically the uh, gap in publications. If in the beginning you are only willing to hire Marie Curie after winning two Nobel prizes, of course, women are going to look better based on their publications, and so there's an indirect effect of this gender bias in hiring on basically these gender gaps in publications. And um, so what we propose is a Roy model that really is combining these two factors and we show that it can reproduce this U-shaped pattern as like the uh, two effects that work against each other. On the one hand, we have the selection effect that you hire the best women first and that these then on average will look better than men. Um, so if you, once you hire more women, basically these gender gaps will widen. 
But on the other hand, there's like what we call the empowerment effect, which is just like a combination of like better coursing opportunities, decreasing gender biases, which in the long run are able to narrow this gender gap in publications and thereby uh, make uh, drive the U upwards. And basically, uh, we are then estimating the structural model in the data. Uh, but in the interest of time, I will just briefly speak about the remaining gender gaps in citations. Here we propose like a new way of controlling for the topics of these papers. Uh, if you are interested in it, uh, basically, uh, yeah, I would refer you to the paper. I've also, we have coded up a Stata package, basically in case you want to implement similar methods in your own work. Uh, but what this allows us is to do, uh, to control for the number of citations a paper should receive if it had been written by a man. Uh, but what we then show, and that's basically what we call our predicted citation control, but what we then show is that including this control in our data makes hardly any difference for the gender gaps in citation, which remain statistically significant and large at around 0.3% uh, uh, or 30% or of a standard deviation in 1900. But then, as a bit of good news, seem to narrow and reach more or less zero uh, in basically uh, the 2000 period in our data. And then last but not least, just to basically stay on time, we also look at uh, gender gaps and promotions, where um, we also see that these gaps basically start off very large and then begin to narrow over the 20th century. And actually, uh, at least based on our estimates, are zero uh, when we compare people from the 1960 to the 2000 cohort. Um, but what is, again, very interesting in our data is that these gender gaps in promotion, in particular in the early period, hardly change once we control for a person's publication and citation record, uh, indicating that like a woman would have to have a lot better publication record to have the same uh, probability of promotion, especially in the early years in our data. So just to conclude on time, I think Again, uh, it might have been uh, a lot to cover within 15 minutes here, um, but what are the three main things you hopefully take away from this presentation? On the one hand, there is vast heterogeneity by country, discipline, and time period. And uh, basically, these, uh, basically, while some countries stay terrible, like we've seen in the case of Japan, other countries like Sweden uh, improve tremendously over the 100 years we have in our data. Then, secondly, not all gender gaps are created equal. While gender gaps in hiring and publications persist even until the end of our data period, gender gaps in citation and promotions consistently narrow over the time period. And then last but not least, uh, I think what is a very nice contribution of our paper since we analyze all these gaps together, is that these gender gaps are heavily interconnected and that uh, basically changes in the gender gap in one domain will have an impact on gender gaps in another domain, which basically you always have to take into account when interpreting any finding about gender gaps. Uh, so I leave it here. Uh, I hope basically uh, it was of interest to you and I'm very much looking forward to the other presentations in this session. Okay, well, thank you to the organizers for organizing the session. This is an important topic and it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, so, I'm not going to give you an introduction. We've already had a fantastic one. Let me start uh, by focusing on a very specific aspect that has been mentioned already. And although Carlo has tried to be quite optimistic, um, maybe a little bit less optimistic, so I'm going to be talking about uh, promotions. And, you know, the evidence seems to indicate that there is a gap in men and women. It seems to be narrowing down, but in economics, it remains large. Within social sciences, we remain the one with the fewest uh, women around. And in terms of promotions, the figures that we see are close to what we see in the STEMs, which we know are very, uh, there's fields with very few women. So 
Why is there a glass ceiling? What can we tell you from the literature about a glass ceiling? Before looking at that, let me just narrow down a little bit on, it's not exactly the same data that Carlo was using, but asking similar question. So this is from some recent work by Emmanuel Oriol and, and co-authors uh, for the association, in fact. And you've got a group of selected uh, countries in Europe plus the United States. And what I'm giving you there is the share of women at all levels, at the entry level and at the senior level. You have, as we would expect, uh, you know, that the US is a country with a low. In fact, in, in the subsample, I've chosen the lowest share of women at all levels, relatively low at the entry level and 20% of women at the senior level. But there's a huge variety within Europe, as you can see, and I've put uh, in red the bad pupil here in my sample, which is Germany, that has an even lower share of senior women than the US. So this to give you an indication that it's not just the US, that there are very large differences, and that, you know, ideally we want to understand all the institutional and social norms behind these differences. This, uh, this paper also shows something which is important and relates a lot to what Carlo was saying before, which is that institutions that are higher ranked also seem to have fewer women in senior positions. In the US, it happens also at the junior level, this correlation between being a higher rank institution and having fewer women. In Europe, the paper doesn't seem to observe that. Uh, there is very little, or relatively little variability and, and a low correlation between rank of the university and share of women. So why are we observing these facts? Why are women having this break in promotions in economics? Why can we observe country heterogeneity? Um, I'm going to talk to you about four factors that I think are contributing to, the, uh, to, to this uh, glass ceiling that we observe. The first one are particular features of the promotion process. I'm going to give you a particular example, uh, France there. And I think it's important that we think about how institutional setups may have an impact. The second thing I want to talk about is the perception of women's output. So women's output may differ, but also we've seen it, the way in which the output is perceived may differ. Citations are one aspect, but maybe also segregation by field is something that affects the way in which women's work is um, perceived. Then I think anybody in this room, any woman in this room of my generation will agree, uh, I'll talk about non-promotable work and how important this is maybe to promotions of women. And then a more speculative aspect is going to be a slide on the length of the process to becoming a tenured or a full professor, which I think is a somewhat worrying development that the, the whole community should be discussing. Um, so I'm going to, to start by talking about some work of mine with um, Clément Bosquet and Pierre-Philippe Combe. And this is a paper in which we look at promotions of French academics in economics. And so what we uh, exploit is uh, the fact that uh, the French system, the academics in the French system traditionally were civil servants, and so we have very good information about who was where, when, and at which level. The traditional system gives you tenured positions straight away, so both junior and senior individuals have a tenured position. And until 2015, promotions in economics were decided at the national level by a committee in Paris where you would uh, be a candidate, and then these candidates would go through several stages and be ranked at this stage, and then, depending on your final ranking, be promoted or not. One feature of this process is that it was highly visible and very much followed by the academic community. So we all followed at each stage who was being ranked, who was passing this stage, and so on. It's a very competitive environment. What the data allow us to do is that because we have all individuals in junior positions, we can create a pool 
of potential candidates, so we know the individuals in France at a given point in time that could have applied for promotion, and then we know who was a candidate and who eventually got a promotion. And so what we do in the paper is to decompose the probability of being promoted between these two stages, the decision of a potential candidate to become a candidate, and then whether or not a candidate is pr actually promoted. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of the data, but just to give you an idea to echo previous work, this is the smooth density of publications uh, for potential candidates. This is a quantity measure, then we also have a quality measure. We actually find relatively small differences in terms of quality, but you can see that the distribution um, for men is shifted to the right compared to that of women, so men have more uh, publications than women, which explains part of the difference in promotion. But then, conditional on publications, on both quantity and quality, what we find by looking at these two stages is that there's an insignificant uh, difference, negative, but never significant in none of the specifications that we look at, between the promotion rate of male and female candidates. In some cases, when we decompose for the various stages, we find a positive and significant effect in favor of women, so that at the very last stage, when you only have a few very high quality candidates, women seem to be helped a little bit. But where we find a very large difference is in terms of becoming a candidate. Women are a lot less likely than men to enter these competitions, this concours. And the effect is very large. Um, it is equivalent to dividing the number of single author publications by two. So this is enormous. And it explains, depending on the various categories um, that we use, between 50 and 76% of the gap. The rest being explained mainly by differences in the publication record. So huge uh, restraint in women applying. The one thing that we cannot answer in the paper is whether women are under applying or men are over applying. What we do find that tends to, to make us saying that women are under applying is that the gap is particularly large at the top. So these are the best women and nevertheless they don't seem to be seeking promotion or not as early in their careers as the men are doing. Um, similar things have been done in other contexts, just to quote two examples, one paper by De Paola et al. looking at Italy in all fields. They don't look exactly at promotions, but at the qualification that you need in Italy in order to become potentially promoted. And they also find that women are less likely to apply. And some work uh, by Laura, uh, who's uh, somewhere over there, um, Leven and, and Lamo. Uh, that looks at the European Central Bank. And again, they find a lower probability that women apply for promotion, although a higher probability that women are promoted offsets this effect. And after some internal policy changes in 2010, they find no gender difference in actual promotion rates. But the two steps seem to be compensating each other. Okay, so promotions um, are a problem. Maybe the context, a very competitive setup like in France, can be restraining women from applying. One possibility also is that women are promoted less often because of the way their work is perceived. And I think there are two elements that uh, we should be thinking about there. One has to do with citations. Women work tends to be less cited than men. The causes are still unclear. People talk about networks. People talk about women giving fewer seminars, attending fewer conferences. Um, I would like to bring to your attention something that uh, I've been reading about lately, which has to do with the way in which language is used in academia. And you've got two citations there, not in economics, different contexts. But uh, the first paper looks at how over time the language that we use has changed and has become more assertive and hedges results less. So people say, my paper is novel, excellent, absolutely path-breaking. The other work I'm citing looks at differences. So that's over time, 
less assert more assertive work, less hedging is taking place. The other paper looks at gender differences, and what it shows is that when the first and last author, this is in science, so first uh, author is the person doing most of the work, last author is the chief of the lab uh, that actually funded the project, and what they show is that when both uh, first and last co-authors are women, the language tends to do much more hedging and sell less the results as being novel, excellent, path-breaking. And so maybe the way in which we're using language differently is also enhancing this different perception of male and female's work. Another aspect that women's work may be valued less is segregation by field. We know that within economics, this is very important. There are subfields that are very male dominated, others in which women are more numerous. If you go to a conference on gender, well, the, the, the Spanish Association Conference of Gender, we're always trying to find men to come uh, to the conference. So can this affect the way in which work is perceived? If certain subfields are dominated by women, are we as a community seeing them as less important, you know, within labor? Is it less of a contribution to work on gender than on unemployment? And is this having an impact in the way in which women's work is perceived during their career? This can also have an effect if when women are seeking promotion, most people in their field are um, women as well, and so their work will be valued less. Non-promotable work. Uh, a lot of women in this uh, room will know that women keep being asked to do tasks that are important for the community but don't help being promoted. Some recent work has shown that women are much more likely to be asked and much more likely to say yes if they're asked, and so this could imply that those differences in publications that we see between men and women are partly related to a different type of contribution to the community. And then um, length of, of the process. This is something that I find very worrying, is becoming longer and longer to go from finishing your undergrad to becoming a tenure professor. This is last longer than in the past. Many European countries have moved away from junior tenure positions. I think this is a good thing in general, but it may, we need to think about the effect it may have on women. Postdocs are becoming more common. And in the US now, there's this pre-doc trend that is also increasing the length of the problem. And we still don't know what the consequences of all that is going to be. And so, in my last minute, a little bit of, of speculation, what could we do as a community to try to make things more equitable for, for women early in their career? We need to think carefully about the promotion process. Maybe some systems are particularly competitive and could be changed from maybe opting in instead of opting out to not put the burden on women to decide whether or not they deserve the promotion. Perception of women's research output. Should we be more careful about the language that we use? Should editors make sure that when a paper says it's path-breaking, it's truly path-breaking? Segregation across fields. I wonder whether associations like these ones could think more. I mean, I know we've all been thinking very much about having women's keynote speakers, but maybe we should think also about having female-dominated fields in the keynote lectures as well, even if not necessarily be given by women. On not promotable work, I'm not going to say anything because I think the solutions are very easy. There's much, much more that we could do and the solutions wouldn't be very costly. And then I think as a community, we should think about the consequences of this lengthening of the process and whether we're risking that many women will you know, leak out of this leaky pipe because it's becoming so long. And I'll stop here. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, 
So I, I'm going to follow up very much closely to the previous two talks, as you'll see, uh, especially to the last one. Uh, and, but before I start, I think uh, let me just quickly introduce myself and just to tell people like why I think I'm here. <laughs> so for, I think it's for two reasons. So on the one hand, I do research uh, like two previous speakers uh, on academia, so in particular on two systems uh, in Europe, which is the Spanish uh, Academia and Italian Academia. So, uh, so I know pretty well those two systems and, uh, and uh, have something to say based on that data uh, and also on publication data in general. Uh, and second, um, I'm Russian myself and I've um, been in many countries in Europe uh, in different positions, uh, starting with a PhD in Italy, moving to France, to some temporal position, some temporal positions in Spain, uh, then some other temporal positions in um, Finland, uh, and now I'm in the UK uh, and I'm an associate professor at Warwick. So, I think I have something to say, let's say, uh, based on my personal experience of, in different countries also, and seeing how differently these uh, systems are organized and, you know, cultures actually differently organized. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so I'll talk about, our, you know, my take, uh, as Cecilia does, uh, did uh, on like what I think are the main issues uh, from both sides, thinking like from research perspective, but also a little bit of a personal, uh, okay. Uh, so, you know everything about uh, the leaky pipeline, so I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, let me just add a couple of uh, few things that I think are maybe are not uh, as known. So, uh, there is a segregation not only in terms of positions, like that you, you see that there are more women are at the say, bottom of the career distribution than in the top, but also across institutions. So, uh, for instance, using the data from Spain on all our dissertations defended in Spain, uh, across all fields actually, uh, if uh, we look at uh, whether women are more likely to proceed, like right, uh, and to go to academia, to stay in academia, we'll see that, of course, not. Uh, yeah, with this leaky pipeline, women are less likely to stay in academia. However, if you control for actual PhD program at which they are in, they're actually more likely to stay in academia, right? So, which indicates that they're actually not in the right PhD programs to start with. They are in a PhD program that uh, is not conductive to an academic career, okay? So it starts early on already, this institutional sorting with some particular potential implications, right? So this is one feature. Uh, another feature, it's, um, it's actually a data uh, collected and processed by a student, Warwick, um, a master student. Uh, so he uh, collected data on public publishing economists over time. Um, these are all publishing economies in uh, seven, more than 700 institutions. And, and so this is data on the share of publishing uh, um, uh, economies in those institutions over time, depending on the rank uh, of the quintile of the distribution of, the, uh, of, of, of that institution. So what you see over time is that, yeah, there were very few women, let's say, in 2000, publishing in general in all institutions, it was increasing a lot, but also um, you see this spread over time, right? So this basically uh, top institutions are uh, increased much, much slowly, like right? in terms of the share of women in those institutions, right? So there is this segregation. So you have, there is a mix in the, in the middle, in the middle is a little bit uh, uh, not clear, but if you, but general picture is that, okay? Women are less likely to be at the top and more likely to be somewhere in the middle and actually more to the bottom. Like in general, in economics overall, okay? This is across all countries, all right? Okay, possible explanations. That is sort of from all coming from the literature. Uh, I'm not actually citing here people's work, and this is amazing work at every single word here on this page. I'm only citing myself, but just to signal where my expertise exactly is, so that you know where, you know, you can sort of ask <laughs> specifically my, uh, my opinion about, all right? But so this is my take, and I think it is very, very closely related to what Cecilia was just talking about. So I think the first thing, uh, uh, which is driving that is um, mobility choices within couple, right? So basically we are in a couple, in a family very often with all sorts of, uh, or kind of planning a family or whatever. Uh, and so we make choices uh, and um, there are several factors that make women less mobile or less willing to, to move than men, right? Uh, and so one of them is of course like or like social norms, okay? So that's, we should prioritize men's, uh, men. Okay, second, uh, 
women are relatively younger, uh, typically, in a couple. That's uh, who knows why. And so they are kind of on a kind of more junior stage in, the, you know, in their career than men. So it's kind of more natural, let's say, to prioritize men at that point, right? Uh, kids are... I mean, kids are there for men and, and women. So you would say, what is, what is the asymmetry really there? Of course, there is childbirth and, and breastfeeding, but that's kind of doesn't seem to be massive relatively to, you know, the, the, the asymmetry in choices. Um, but they start anchoring earlier, right? So women than men, right? And so it's early in the career that women just can't afford any more that move than, than a man. Right? Uh, and particularly, it, it becomes very important in the context where actually the time to set the tenure and all these moves that are required before you get there are actually becoming more and more, right? So it's like more postdocs, more pre-docs, you have to keep moving. Uh, and, um, you know, for women it becomes harder and harder to, to just keep up with that uh, process, right? Uh, you can think um, of professional support, kind of, of course, if there are fewer women at the top, uh, you know, there are fewer role models, fewer kind of networking, perhaps possibility if, if that's, you know, gendered networks are an important component of that. Behavioral traits. I put it in, uh, in quotes so that we sort of don't think about that, that we are born with those uh, traits. But nevertheless, we know that by the time we make choices, we behave differently. Um, right? So women shy away from competition. They have poor bargaining skills. Our, they don't apply for promotions, of course, they, uh, they don't seek for, for, for those, um, and they are more likely to engage in non-promotable tasks, so you'll know all that, right? And then discrimination, uh, and that discrimination is sort of a very broad thing in reality, if you think about it. So this is one thing starting from uh, students, right? There's research suggesting that women receive um, lower teaching evaluations for exactly the same type of uh, performance of those students in ex, you know, an anonymized exam or also in the future, um, which may affect where women dedicate their time, right? So we also see that women spend more time on preparation of teaching, so which may be a reaction to that, right? You have toxic professional climate, which in general makes uh, you know, people less productive, of course, if you, you have to face that. Maybe you have to actually move or change institution because of that. Uh, you may face stereotypes um, as a woman. Um, there is this attribution of merit uh, or kind of interpretation, let's say, of signals or, or work and citations. But this attribution of merit uh, maybe is also an issue, which is like there is some evidence on that, right? That, you know, co-authored work uh, might be interpreted differently for women and men. Um, then these things, these stereotypes, attribution, interpretation of signals and so on, uh, they kick in when? When we typically have information asymmetries, right? When we have to evaluate candidates uh, in the fields that we are not certain about, like we are not exactly experts in those fields. And since there is gender segregation in research interests, uh, that becomes extremely relevant. And there is this gender segregation across institutions, uh, you know, in there is this uh, segregation in terms of across journals, right, and things like that, and it might manifest itself in the kind of lower success rate of women and stronger stereotypes used against women, right? Um, gendered networks is another thing. We know that networks matter, connections matter in many situations. Connections are gendered. There is no much evidence of the number of connections being uh, like as different, but they or them mattering differently, let's say, but they're gendered. Uh, and as soon as we have, again, gatekeepers or more men at the top, uh, you know, with these connections, women may be at disadvantage somewhere. At the same time, our own research, uh, where we use data from Spain and Italy, uh, and we use uh, a situation where promotions were decided by committees that were randomly formed from the pool of people in the same field, okay, so we could see uh, exploit kind of random composition uh, uh, of committees and see what happens if you have randomly um, more women in the committee, uh, whether it helps women or not. We actually find in the context of this kind of national evaluations in Italy and, and, and France, in Spain, um, that no, the answer is no, it doesn't matter. If anything, it doesn't have a positive impact, you know. We may even talk about some negative impact in some situations, right? Uh, 
which seems kind of to go kind of in conflict with the previous two points, but the points were, I think the points, we actually show, you know, that gendered networks exist, that networks matter. We also show that there's uh, gendered interests and interests proximity matters, but it's just basically that in that context, that was not extremely uh, strong, let's say, you know, there was not much role for connections. Connections were, you know, rare, let's say, to be drawn, uh, and our interests were pretty narrowly defined. But in some other contexts, when we talk about, you know, maybe promotion committees at the university level or something like that, that may actually uh, be relevant, all right? Okay. Now, what I want to uh, spend a uh, a few minutes on is to reflect along those lines and kind of speculate with some ideas. So I like to say, okay, we have to have a discussion. Okay, let's, let's try to have this discussion. Let's just, you know, think about some concrete ideas that maybe some institutions can do here and there, right? Along those lines, thinking about the problems, right? And so I was thinking, okay, if our mobility decisions are affected by norms, uh, um, should we affect those norms? I think the answer here is it's difficult to affect the whole norm uh, from the, you know, from academia side. Maybe it's like a societal uh, thing rather than uh, really a uh, specific uh, institution can do it. But maybe there are some things, maybe, you know, if it's, uh, there is a problem uh, uh, with our uh, finding a job for a partner, male or female, maybe you should be a little bit kind of having some service, let's say helping people uh, to, to move. Um, then uh, I thought that of course, you know, if not norm, so we can't kind of solve the cause of the problem, but maybe we can sort of help uh, people who are suffering from the existence of this norm. Why would we care to start with? You say, well, I mean, that's their choices. I think we are caring because of, first, this sort of allocation of talent. We want talented women to do research and to be in institutions and places where they are the most, most productive. Uh, so uh, this is one thing. And we also want to keep them in academia, right? So that they don't drop out. So that we have good representation um, of female sort of interest in science to start with, you know, so in this sense, we do care. So we want to, to, to help them, right? So maybe we want to help women if they can't, you know, place themselves and go somewhere uh, for a job, like take a job somewhere because of family reasons, yeah. So maybe we can think about helping them to move there and to kind of, to build up their networks on some short-term programs or something like that, All right? Uh, we should have this discussion of the role of pre-docs and post-docs, and I'm very happy that it was already brought up. Uh, should we think about restarting grants, uh, sort of uh, grants for women who are coming back from maternity leave, so something like that, restarting their careers? Uh, it exists in some places, so why don't we kind of talk about it a little bit more? Uh, professional support for networking and role models, I think here uh, we had a fantastic event uh, of uh, mentoring um, uh, retreat, right? So I think uh, this is kind of, I think the way to go, it's uh, easier to go. Uh, we, so in terms of like just, you know, blindly promoting sort of uh, women, pushing them to senior roles because, oh, if you have more uh, women in, uh, in senior roles, that will help to attract other women. We have research exploiting the random promotion of women uh, in Spain, which um, current research we're working on it right now, which seems to show that uh, there's no evidence for that. So if you have, if you push a marginal woman over the bar, it doesn't seem to help uh, to attract more more women, let's say, to a PhD program or things like that. So um, maybe that's not exactly the way to go, but you know, uh, some other ways could be. Uh, behavioral traits, and uh, uh, we could probably think as to sort of have some, what I call automatic promotion, which is sort of, for instance, in the university that I'm in now, we have this sort of periodic uh, reminder from HR saying that we need to, uh, th you, sh you should think about um, promote, promotion and apply applying for promotion. And so that sort of pushes you to think that maybe that's my moment uh, to talk to people about it. Um, maybe pay transparency. Are, in terms of non-promotable tasks, um, like workload um, models, like we have, uh, for instance, at Warwick, I think it's, it works great, where we really try to have uh, sort of the whole uh, list of all tasks that we do in academia, make sure that we equally uh, allocate all the load, you know, and if something is overpriced or underpriced on that list, we adjust it uh, for the next year. Uh, so I think that uh, that works pretty well. So even committee work uh, at the end becomes not that costly because you sort of compensate it with other tasks. Right. 
Um, discrimination, I think we can think about, it, of course, awareness to start with. So it's great that we have more events like that and people hear about research than um, uh, uh, showing uh, all sorts of biases. Um, I, think, I think for me, the, one of the most important things is rethinking our field composition of departments. Uh, because it is, we are coming from historic sort of male representation of interests in science. Uh, departments that try to hire a woman, so if you go from the, you know, side uh, of recruiters, we are typically like, you know, anxious of finding those women, but we want a woman that does macro, and we want a woman that does um, um, theory or something like that, uh, to kind of, to preserve the composition of department, but also go those women. Uh, and of course it becomes impossible because, you know, those women there, <laughs> there's like gold on the market, everybody wants them. But if you uh, think, kind of rethink how should be your field composition of the department, reflecting a little bit more uh, the composition perhaps of interests uh, of the society, of students, then maybe uh, it will be easier to achieve that goal. Um, and also assuring <clears throat> the <clears throat> field proximity of the promotion committee to your candidates, female and male candidates, <clears throat> sorry, I think are, would be fundamental for kind of fair tenure decisions. Okay, and don't seek parity on committees, given my all, uh, own work, I'm against the idea of uh, have, having just kind of these blind um, gender parity rules, right? Uh, so I have zero minutes, but I have the whole super nice slide <laughs> uh, to young women. And I'd, let me just borrow one uh, minute on that, okay? So what I think are important uh, for, that was for institutions, as, as, as economists and institutions, that's what we can think and reflect about. But if I'm kind of a junior researcher, a woman, uh, so what should uh, I do, no? Uh, so I would suggest that Networking is, is really important, so keep alive your networks, create those networks, reach out to people. Uh, try to control your time spent on, you know, administrative work and teaching. We tend to spend time on teaching at the expense of our family life, so not at the expense of something else you, th you, you thought. So uh, have a life <laughs> and try to think uh, about the choices you make. Um, there is lots of um, heterogeneity in terms of positions across institutions. Uh, you might find yourself uh, in some weird job somewhere. Uh, uh, that uh, could be an opportunity for us as well, because you could sort of build up your career the way you want, uh, given the heterogeneity of positions available um, in different countries in different contexts. Uh, and also it's an opportunity to not stress out if something doesn't work out. So if it doesn't work out at one path that you've chosen, don't worry, there's zero paths that you can take uh, and they are fine as well. And so kind of my final note is that uh, don't lose confidence if suddenly something goes not the way uh, you expected at some stage. Uh, just nobody thinks of you, judges you in any way. So just you are privileged to do this fantastic um, uh, job of, you know, talking to interesting people, reflecting on interesting topics. So enjoy it. Uh, don't stress out. Use resources you have and uh, produce good work and move on. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, first, as a timekeeper, I should apologize because um, I feel guilty to have cut uh, you. <laughs> Uh, this great presentation. So, but we have um, um, a nice uh, cocktail coming. Uh, it's a Shoop Shoop restaurant, which is a 20 minutes uh, walk, right, uh, more or less. So, but still we will have some questions, so, but uh, keep it short, okay? Just think about the cocktail. And the answer is also short answers, short questions. Okay, who wants to start? There's, I think that there is a mic, but... Um, I think there's, where is, where is the mic?
think that what Carlo is going to answer to both. First, because he's got more data than we do, and second, because he's a man. Uh, so I, I came, uh, but I know. Uh, regarding your first question, I think, which is something I've been thinking about a lot. I think, it, so in econ, we have the theory of statistical and taste-based discrimination everybody in this room is probably familiar with, was we kind of, we don't have a well-established theory of is what might one call like institutional discrimination. If we just basically, if we put a group of people into a room and let them basically decide what the characteristics of our profession are going to be, they're going to tailor that to them. Basically, a lot of the rules of academia basically probably were set like a hundred years ago in a room of full of white men, that these are not necessarily suitable on the one hand uh, for women, but I think also for a lot of other minorities. And it, it's again, um, like in other work I've done is we now look at the underrepresentation based on like social background, like the best predictor of becoming academic is having an academic as your father. But of course that's basically that's not a very equitable either and these gaps are often far larger than basically also the gaps we observe on gender. So uh, I completely agree with your point and I think that the problems we have uh, like with gender gaps or gender discrimination also are basically in many other settings. Well, of course, not all will have the same solution. So like, uh, like, uh, like, yeah, uh, basically extended tenure clocks due to basically childbirth are not going to help someone who comes from a lower economic background. So we need tailored solutions. Uh, but I think what we have to keep in, I think what you rightly point out is that really the system is not necessarily set up in a way that it basically benefits this under basically represented minorities due to the fact that it was set up by the minor uh, majority. And it's always that, yeah, if you have like a selection process at the end, basically you will have people who survived and then say, ah, yeah, the process works fine. And uh, anyone who basically wants to change it is basically uh, has the wrong idea. And I think that's basically what I think we might need to think more about what could be referred to as institutional discrimination. Uh, regarding the second point, uh, I, I don't know, basically, I, I'm, <laughs> I basically, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how we basically uh, could motivate more men to come. Usually, maybe like cocktails would have helped maybe advertise that more broadly, but uh, yeah, uh, otherwise we can try next year. <laughs> To there are probably more men registered to the to the cocktail than than here. <laughs> I appreciate all the data that you collect and presented these trends. I think which are very important to document where are women and how many women. But to ask for more, so I, I'm wondering the positive news could be presented and highlighted more what women bring in into economics, because surely economics, the research topics, genders, they change maybe too slowly. I mean, you mentioned, for example, gender economics. Um, today I was sitting in the Marshall Lecture. So surely there's more difference than the topic. It's about methods, about data. Um, so there are many aspects of economics research. So it could be really cool to measure this, even more to document this change. And it may also be interdisciplinary, so to make it even more difficult. But do you have any uh, data or is there any, uh, are you aware of any So this is a very good question. And in fact, this is something that we are looking at the data right now, are searching the data right now. So trying to see, so we do see in the data that the topics that were done more by women, uh, let's say 30 years ago, uh, and now grew up. So they are much in general kind of uh, became bigger. Uh, so the question is how much it is due to 
um, female representation that, that women entered, they're interested in these topics and so topic grew as, or it's just became a sort of a more mainstream topic. Uh, and so that men are also joining uh, in and so the topic uh, just develops uh, in general. And also uh, at the moment I'm, so I, I've talked a little bit about this research that we are doing right now when what happens if you have more women uh, at senior roles at the department with our female students in these departments. Uh, and so, not female, in, students in general, uh, like, um, and uh, we don't find any impact on the gender composition of our PhD student body. But what we do see is that, of course, uh, our many more students are uh, now advised by women and in particular female students. So it's become, like, becoming actually more segregated and it affects actually topics they do. Yeah, so, uh, so there is this shift, this dynamic shift of more women implies more research that women like and do. Uh, so I, I, the question would be maybe, uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing for, for that junior, let's say women <laughs> who's changed their topics career-wise? But of, I think as a society, uh, we are of course better off to have a better representation of our sort of our societal interests uh, in, in, in science. Other questions or? Okay, thank you everyone. So uh, Cecilia pointed out the, the bad student. I think it would be good to uh, focus on the good students as well, no? And, and what determines, what are the practices they, they use uh, that are relevant for that to end up being performing well in terms of gender? For, for everyone, eh? not just for you, Cecilia. Um. Oof. Uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I mean, the, the, there's clearly a change in, oh, no, let me go back. So one of the things that Emmanuel Oriol's paper shows is that there is a correlation between gender norms measured in different ways and the data that I showed you. So there's a, cul a, a more general cultural aspect in a country and how countries are changing attitudes towards gender that seems to be affecting the university system. So that's in the data. My speculation is that uh, two things are important, but this is pure speculation. Uh, actually, they're the same thing, probably. I was going to say excellence, and the US is there, and this extremely hierarchical system that characterizes the German uh, academia. Mm. And so, of course, excellence is something that we want to pursue, <coughs> but I think a question is to be aware of what are the costs of pursuing excellence and, and how far we, we want to go with that. Uh, in the case of uh, the German system, even the French system on which we do our data, which uh, was uh, used to be extremely, extremely competitive, you know, maybe flatter organizations help more. And maybe this, you know, six, eight year long postdocs in Germany where then you need to move to a different university and so on. This is clearly not helping at all. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe, you know, we need to, to do much more in terms of comparative analysis of institutions. Maybe if it's just descriptive, maybe if we cannot quantify those things, but that's something that maybe the committee could think about. Thank you.